Okay, hello there. My name is Ryan, and I lead the Google Doodle team. And I'm here with a very special guest at the Googleplex, uh, Mr. Wayne White. Give it up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I've been a fan of Wayne's work before I even knew there was um, such a thing as being a fan. Um, uh, he entered his work entered into many millions of American homes with the puppet design and other assorted. Uh, creativity for with Pee Wee's Playhouse. Um, it was years later when I first saw I saw one of your uh, word paintings on the album cover for Lamb Chop's uh, Nixon. Yep. And then a few years later after that, that I was in a diner in L.A. Fred 62, and I'm like, I know this stuff. And then a little bit longer after that, when I saw a beautiful book that was recently produced called I Will Now Get the Maybe uh, Now. Maybe Now. Maybe now I'll get the respect I so richly deserve. Right. Hey. Yeah. I think today is the turning point for that. Um, if I have anything to do with it. Finally. Finally. <laughs> Today's the September day. September 10th, 2012. Yes. Um, and uh, and it all came together in a really wonderful movie that's coming out uh, this fall. Well, it's it, it, it's out now. Technically out. It premiered September 7th, and it's called Beauty Is Embarrassing. And it's the story of my life and times. <laughs> Wonderful. And it's actually going to open up in San Francisco and oh. many other Bay Area locations this yes. weekend. Yes. I will be in the Bay Area uh, this weekend. It's going to be in San Francisco, Berkeley, uh, San Jose, and Santa Cruz. You can go to beautyisembarrassing.com <laughs> for the theaters and times. I can't remember them all. But uh, I take it a day at like a time. Like 7 ish, 7 p.m., maybe? Yeah, uh, probably the uh, 7 or 8. Time. Yeah. <laughs> You can call the theater. You can see the listings on yeah. beautyisembarrassing.com and call your theaters. Yeah. But I will be back up here. I love the Bay Area. I always have a great reception when we come up here. Pandering to the local crowd. I love you all. <laughs> and YouTube. Go you love YouTube. I imagine you love YouTube and the people I, who watch YouTube. Of videos. course, you kidding? I'm on YouTube every day. Um, well, you have a lot of new stuff going on. Yes. Always moving forward. Uh, if we get to speaking of moving forward, but it's not. You're not new to art. This is actually, this is a picture of your great-grandfather? No, it's me. I've been doing these paintings since 1878. Ah. Yeah. You aged very well. I am a vampire. <laughs> That's how I can do so much. I, I actually, um, there's so much to talk about just in this photograph. One is that your eyes look really weird. Did you blink or something? No, uh, this is actually, a, this was done by the great photographer Stephen Berkman, and this is his medium. He uses an original 1860s glass plate negative camera. It's called an ambrotype. He plays by all the 19th century rules, uses the same chemicals. He uses only natural light. And this particular kind of film, the ambrotype, does not pick up blue. Oh. It does not pick up light blues. Blue reads as white. So that's why my eyes have that creepy white glow to them, because I have light blue eyes. That's a terrific answer, even yeah. if it's not true. It's true. <laughs> it's true. I believe you. So I, we could actually, I feel like we could talk for the entire time just about this image, because there's all these other images in it. But one thing that I love, and I think it's kind of like sums up in many ways your philosophy. So maybe I don't want you to spoil all the good stuff, but the who's he think he is image. Yeah. Could you unpack that? that? Who, who do you think you are? Yeah, that particular painting there, Who's He Think He Is? That is sort of, uh, and I, I think a lot of my fellow artists maybe can relate to this, and I talk about it in the movie. It's a feeling of like, especially in our culture, who do you think you are getting up there and making a spectacle of yourself? You know, you must have a very high opinion of yourself to go out there and push your so-called vision on the world or to be an artiste as people like to call you you know to, that's a subtle way of putting you down i hate that word yeah Art, when say, oh here comes the artiste i use it just to sort of make fun of the word yeah, yeah. double back on yeah, it yeah, yeah. but this culture Plenty. does not respect or nurture artists yeah maybe maybe the san francisco area there's pockets of culture that does but on the whole especially you can understand being mm. a midwest boy yourself yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm a southern boy they do not respect and nurture artists. Yeah. And you grow up with this sort of uh, insecure feeling of, yeah, who do I think I am for doing yeah. this? You know, because nobody, you know, everybody looks askance at me, you know. And it takes a certain amount of ego to be an artist. And you sort of, uh, in, our, in our culture also sort of looks down on the ego, as they should, because it can get out of control. But the artist's ego is such that 
you start to question it. Well, maybe I am a little out of control with the ego. And who do I think I am? And it's just the natural insecurity of the human condition to, to question yourself that way. And it's, and it's amplified when you take the artist's path, you know? And it's, and it's amplified also when you see people better than you are. Well, who, yeah. do I think, who, who do I think I am? This guy's 10 times better than me. I'm, I'm humbled by it. You, you mentioned respect for artists. That's a good lead into the, uh, we have another slide if you want to show. Talk a little bit about this painting. This is called Picasso's Ass Falling Off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is, a, this is a secret that I've never revealed when I've said this title or shown this painting. Mm. I first heard the expression ass falling off yeah. from the artist James Rosenquist. Uh, yeah, the, of, he used to be a billboard painter, another commercial artist turned fine artist. Yes, he's a yeah. very famous pop artist, yeah. uh, very influential in the culture. And I happened to meet him at a party once that I went to with the great Red Grooms, yeah. who I also worked for at one time in New York City. And I was like this 24-year-old <laughs> kid straight out of Tennessee in this room full of these superstars of American art. And Rosenquist was holding court about his days as a billboard painter. Yeah. This is kind of off topic, but uh -huh. he goes, and the, yeah, and I went to the boss that day. I said, boss, I feel like my ass is going to fall off. <laughs> and I thought about that term for years, and I associate with art and artists. Yeah. And that inspired me to have Picasso's ass falling off. <laughs> and this is just sort of a jab at the king of art, yeah. Pablo, Pablo Picasso. I mean, it's, it's a guy that anybody who's put a pencil to paper or tried to make a painting, that's one guy you have to get around or over or through. You have to pass through Picasso land sooner or later if yeah. you're an artist. And this is just kind of like uh, throwing darts at the king, you know. Uh, I, it's not, I, I, I love Picasso, all artists do, you can't help but, you have to pay respect, but at the same time, this reflects sort of one of my um, abiding passions in art is to bring humor into fine art, yeah. and to poke pins and pretensions, to uh, rail against the king, yeah. you know? That's a very American thing, we hate kings. That's why, we, that's why this culture, that's why this country was started, oh, yeah. to rail against monarchy to break down class systems. And that's a, a big part of what humor does, is to break down walls and to laugh at class distinctions and everything, and to bring everything to a level playing field. We're all hairless apes. Well, some more than others. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what is it about art that is so uh, afraid of humor, do you think? I mean, I guess, it may, and is that universal, or is it just, do you think it's historical? It's not or? necessarily universal, and there's, I, first of all, I consider humor a, a, an elevated form of consciousness. I think it's one of the most sacred, valuable qualities we have as human beings. And so why not, why shouldn't it be worthy of the canon of art? Why shouldn't it be in museums and whatnot? Um, but I, I consider stand-up comics, especially people like Richard Pryor, yeah. Lenny Bruce, George Carlin, to be fine artists. Yeah. It's one of the finest art forms there is. Um, but, you know, art is famously humorless, especially critics, curators, a certain type of class consciousness of all invades art. People, they go to the best schools, the Ivy League schools, the Ivy League people control the art world and through criticism and through curatorship and through the fast track that they're on by going to mm. these moneyed schools. Moneyed schools do not want to talk about humor. Yeah. So, you know, humor is considered lightweight and low. It's considered a, you know, an entertainment and, and not worthy of like serious contemplation. Did stuff. you did you ever read the book Ways of Seeing by John Berger? Yes. I've read all, I've read all, that's another thing. I don't, You've read every book? You're going to say I've read, read all books? I've read every book there is. No, I, I'm that very... That makes it easier to discuss with you because I... I come, I come from this, you know, this working class chip on my shoulder kind of attitude, but I've, I've run the gamut. I've read Berger, Clement Greenberg, yeah. all the criticisms. I love fine art. Yeah. I love the higher forms of art. I love seriousness. I love drama. I love... I love the challenges of difficult art. I'm not discounting any of it. I'm just saying there's room for other forms of it. Yeah. The thing, well, the thing that blew my mind, I was like in high school, I think, when an art teacher gave that book to me. And this is more, less about humor, but more about the value of maybe commercial art. Was he, and I totally maybe misread this, so someone could go back and look this up, and I, this is like 15, 14, 16 years ago. But I, I remember him talking about 
fine art having this inherent classicism because it's an art object owned by one person. And with that rarity and scarcity, it becomes a situation of supply and demand and the rich person gets it. Yes. And so I think it's interesting. I mean, you've had a, a, a career, multifaceted career. We talked about it a little bit, but um, art that is not exclusive to one person, but you know, can still be art, right. seems to threaten that long established you know, True. supply and demand. And Berger, if I'm not mistaken, was like communist or at least a socialist, <laughs> right? Uh, he he said, was. There just seemed to be he implications. Was, yeah, yeah. He was a radical socialist and he believed in uh, bringing up the, the, the thorny problem of class within the art world. Yeah. And that's a dirty secret of the art world. It's yeah. very much ruled by money and the money class. And uh, I forgot my direction. Can I more. tell you a story why I chose in art school not to go into fine art, but to go into illustration sure. as a major? Please do. So I was in, I feel like I should be looking at the camera. This is We're, a serious moment. But when I, when I was, I was uh, 19, 18 years old, and I went, uh, the, my school, I went to Parsons School of Design, and, and the fine arts department has well, wonderful students and teachers. But when I went to the information session, when they're like trying to get you to pick a major, they had free pizza, which was like a, a big draw <laughs> for me. Uh, poor student and whatnot. And um, they were going on and on about how wonderful their facilities were, that they had, um, you know, state of the art, uh, they had studio space right in Manhattan, and, um, you know, access to the galleries and museums, and. And for people that were into sculpture, they had just bought a plasma cutter. And meanwhile, I'm trying to get pizza off of the, you know, the pie, right? Yeah. I'm trying to pull this slice of pizza and kind of trying to keep it cool. But I, the smart Alec in me couldn't help but blurt out, like, can I use the plasma cutter to get this pizza? <laughs> and that went over like a lid balloon. Totally crickets. Yeah. And then I was like, I don't need these guys. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It's like, I know, it's like, Humor is, is one of my acid tests for human beings. <laughs> you know what I mean? If, if somebody doesn't have a sense of humor, it's over. Yeah. I can't relate to them. Yeah. Uh, I, I value humor. The, the, paradoxically, you can't analyze humor and put it on too high elevation mm. or it kills it. Yeah. It's this precious little flower, you know, that has to grow in a certain way. But why can't it grow in a museum? Why can't it be considered uh, uh, worthy of... of, of I think it has depth. Yeah, I do. I agree as much you. depth as any other form of art. I agree with you. The best humor has le levels of sadness and all the all the emotions. Right on. Can I get the next slide? I don't. So this is somewhat of a good transition here. So you uh, grew up in Tennessee, as you mentioned. Yes, Chattanooga, and, Tennessee. Chattanooga, um, and then you uh, moved to New York. Kind of hightail, you went to college in uh, Tennessee. I went, I had four years of undergraduate school at a state university, Middle Tennessee State University. I drifted around Nashville, Tennessee about a, for a half year after I graduated. I saw a magazine called Raw Magazine put out by Art Spiegelman in 1981. Yeah. And that inspired me to move to New York because I saw in that magazine and his spirit and the artist in that magazine, the birth of a new world, the birth of a new art form. And I was right, that magazine, and that scene in the early 80s in New York is, is becoming true today in the renaissance of graphic novels. Go to any comic book yeah, it's store. everywhere. Yeah. And it all started back then, at least in America, in the early 80s in New York City, down on Green Street in Soho at Art Spiegelman Studio. When you were in Middle Tennessee University, uh, but you, found, you also found like a community of folks. I was lucky enough, coincidentally, to run into a, a fellow weirdo oddballs from small towns of, of from the South, and we were all dying to validate each other. We had all come from a suppressed background. We had all been made to feel like outsiders, and suddenly we were together and reinforcing each other. And that was, I always say, uh, your fellow students are just as important or maybe more important to your education than your, than your teachers are. I think you can learn as much from, you, know, you can learn as much from your, uh, from your peers as you can from your instructors and your authority, so-called authority figures. And that's where I first came out of my shell and became a, first learned about art and art history and, and just as art as a lifestyle, as something that can bleed out of the classroom, into the streets, become a part of your life, everyday life. Uh, so it seems like clear to me, like, and I, I had a similar experience when I went to, uh, feel free to check your email or no. whatever. <laughs> I'm going to turn it cut off. This out. <laughs> no, I, so it seems uh, clear to me that that community was really helped like as a launching pad. 
and I'm sure many of the creative people in the audience and watching this uh, on YouTube or whatever have, have had that experience. Do you, do you feel like now in today's uh, in the very connected world, how do you feel like technology is, is helping people find weirdos and communities that they're, you know, I, feel I, accepted and validated by? I think it's helping a lot. I think it's helping connect people in ways that are really positive. I'm not one of those guys that rues the day before computers. I'm not one of those guys that says, that believes in a golden age or the good old days. Young people, please believe this for sure. There's no good old days. There's no golden age that you missed out on. You're not missing out on anything. You're, you're alive right now. Now is your golden age. Don't listen to some old fart tell you it used to be better. Because it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't better. It's, it's, what is important is make this your golden age. And when you get to be my age, don't sit around saying, boy, back in the Google days, back when Google first started. Don't do that to you. Please, remember this day when I'm telling you, don't, don't, don't turn into one of those people. Look forward. Keep believing in the future and change. Awesome. Um, next. So I want to go a little bit back. This is a still from the movie. It's one of my favorite sections. There's a lot of talk in the movie about your upbringing and about your relationship with your both your family, like your parents, yes. but then your new family, which is really terrific, which we'll talk yes. about in a second. But there, it just goes over, you have a line in the movie that I love, and this is your sister about to spank you. Yes. Um, and you said, you said something, like, something like, your sister was the person who, who let you know that you, you told you you were gonna die one day, and yes. made sure you understood the concept. Yes, uh, this, <laughs> yes. I love it, because that, that's I, I what I'm, that. that's what the, VO is right when this scene is happening. I said, my, and my sister was the first badass. She was the one that told me I was going to die one day and made crystal clear, I made sure I was crystal clear on the concept. What, so we, we chatted a little bit earlier. And you're and talking that's true. About, you were talking about the old fogies, talking about the good old days and how that relates to a fear of death. Yeah. In a sense. I'm kind of curious how, if you would unpack that for me. And also, like how you know your sister, you're you're just a young in here. Yeah, I'm like uh, four years old there. Yeah, and she's letting you know, and I'm imagining at an early age this idea of you know, you know, you're you're an, you're an infallible mortal. It's a pretty yes. heavy thing to learn, but it is. Seems like you take that lesson to heart today. You know what? I can trace my first existential crisis to that day when my sister very patiently explained to me that we were all going to be dead forever one day, and I remember <laughs> just, I remember the feeling when it first pierced me that that, yeah. that was a realization. And I think that's, and I've had, I've had anxiety attacks my whole life about that. And I think a lot of us have the same feelings. I think a lot of us, the, the mortality thing creeps up on you when you least expect it and, you, and you, you're short of breath and you suddenly realize, wow, you know, this is, this is a, a limited engagement yeah. we're all in. And I think that's a painful realization, but I think it's a realization that most artists share. That that's, what, that's one of the motivators, that's one of the engines of art is knowing that this is a limited engagement, that we're here, time is precious, and we've got to do the best we can with it. And I think that's one of the great things about artists is they take advantage of that time. They're, I think we all have this acute realization that we have a, that you know, we're mortal. And I think art is sort of a, as they say, it, the academic term is memento mori. Mm. That's one of the big themes of art. It's been there ever since art began. It's one of the, you know, still lives from the, uh, from the golden age. No, here I go, golden <laughs> yeah. age. Still lives Well, as from a the, vampire, you have a much wider perspective. <laughs> still lives from the Renaissance on are, are, are symbolic of death. They're called memento mori, fruit, flowers, mm. you know, they're all, that's, that, those are subtle symbols of, of death and re reminding us of, our, of the mortal coil, you know. So the, the, uh, the realization of mortality is built into art, and that's what gives it its, its poignancy and its power. And that's what gives humor its power. Yeah. Humor is often uh, a reaction against a, uh, a um, release, against, a fear release of, against fear, facing that, that horrible truth. You know, so that's why humor should be right up there, yeah. along with the old masters and stuff. Because it, that's what an artist does. He, he defies death, yet he also comes to, to terms with it. And that's why art is, a, is in the spiritual realm. Do you, do you want to I come from a big family. I'm in the middle of five kids, and I know that my siblings did a lot to shape me as a person and as a creative person. Um, 
What about you? It doesn't see it, from what I gather, like, it seemed like your sister was particularly creative, but your mom was pretty creative. My, my mother was the first artist, so to speak, in my life, the first aesthete. She was, mind you, I grew up in a very, uh, a very uh, it was the 60s in the South, which was the 50s, really. <laughs> and, uh, it was like, the, but still 10 years above the Midwest, I think. <laughs> it was still like the future for us. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in a blue collar uh, environment. All my father's friends, my father himself, they all worked at DuPont Nylon Factory. There wasn't an artist in sight, there wasn't a gallery in sight, there wasn't a museum. And so the, the first artist in that, in that kind of environment was my mother because she, uh, she loved antiques. She loved to, to decorate. She took me to antique stores all the time. She admired objects for their beauty. And her sense of uh, interior decorating, she redecorated the house like every month. And so she was a designer. Yeah. And she was my first idea of someone who could uh, enjoy the visual and, and enjoyed expressing the visual. Want to hit the next slide? So this is your just a shot of your family now. Yes. Or from the movie a couple yes. years back, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody seems really creative. What's it like being, you know, almost inverted in the sense where now you're in a family full of artists? Your wife Mimi Pond is. Yes, that? this is my wife Mimi Pond, my daughter Lulu White, and my son Woodrow White, who is an art major here in Oakland at the California cool. College of the Arts. And of course, my wife is a famous cartoonist. A lot of you are familiar with her work. She's been. Uh, on the national scene since the, since the late 70s. She started out here in Oakland at the California College of the Arts. She wrote the first episode of she The Simpsons? She wrote the first episode of The Simpsons. She started out in the, in the National Lampoon back when it was a, a good magazine, which back when it was the National Lampoon <laughs> in the late 70s. She went on to create the Valley Girls craze. She wrote a best-selling book, Valley Girls Guide to Life. She's, worked, she's done five other humor books. She's working on a 500-page opus about her life in Oakland in the 70s when punks took over from the hippies. Um, so, and, and, and my daughter is a very talented painter. They, they, they just, it just came to them naturally. It's in the genes. And this is my dream come true, you know, to, to uh, nurture artists and be surrounded by artists in my own little bubble there in Las Feliz, in, in, in uh, Los, Los Angeles, California. Cool. So I think next, uh, we have, there's a, this is a trailer from the movie I thought we'd just play sure. it, just to give people an idea. This is Beauty is Embarrassing. Thank you. Thank you. I, w I watched it twice last week. Oh. I didn't have to, I, and I, I liked it that much. And you're still talking to me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'd watch it again. Um, you heard uh, it. It's good stuff. So, um, a lot, I mean, there was so much packed in there, and you guys should definitely see the, you should see the movie. Um, happy to shill for it, it's a great movie. Um, one is that you play banjo, which you didn't bring. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Two is that you dance, which you don't need any banjo for. No. <laughs> no. Uh, they say, you know, that phrase, dance like nobody's watching. Yeah. Well, people, I, I forgot that people were watching. <laughs> Well, the third is that you, uh, we talked a bit, I want to talk a bit about Pee Wee. And, sure. Um, so, um, you know, Pee Wee was a special, special thing in American culture. It sure I mean, was. It was just um, so much creativity and originality, and it was a huge hit. Yeah. I mean, it was a, yeah, it was a big, it was a big deal in my childhood. And just basically as like a weird kid in the Midwest, uh, it felt like a breath of fresh air. And um, I think Matt Groening said it best when he said it. He was referring to Pee Wee in the trailer yes. when he said, "If there's, if there's, if this could make it, like there's hope for us all." Yes. And that's yeah. kind of that's what I took away from the movie, but in particular from Pee Wee, like that's just one of these moments of like you know the the good guys won. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, how did you how did you go from your New York cartooning into that? And I just want to hear all about it. Well, I, I, like I said, I moved to New York to be a cartoonist, but at the same time, I'd been doing these crazy, wacky puppet shows on my own, just these do-it-yourself, homemade productions. I started those back in Tennessee at the university. Uh, that was when punk rock first hit. I couldn't play a guitar, so I picked up a puppet yeah. instead. And I did these things called, I called them punk rock puppet shows. Like the first one was called Punk and Juicy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, uh, the puppets bled fountains of blood. <laughs> we would throw bowls of Cheerios and milk at the audience. We'd set fire to the stage. We'd come out and choke members of the audience and provoke <laughs> fights. It was very confrontational. 
it was kind of anti-puppet, you know. Yeah. It was the era of Andy Kaufman and Mr. Bill and, like I said, punk rock. It was like all about deconstruction and destruction, you know. It was, a, it was about a kicking down the old conventions and finding something new, taking apart the idea of showbiz, confronting the audience, which is not a new idea at all. It was also my idea of art history, like we, I thought of myself as a Dadaist, you know, in the tradition of Hugo Ball and all those guys that came out of, of the, the uh, aftermath of World War I. Sounds like the perfect set for children's television. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Right up kids' alley. Yeah. Everybody wants to know about a dystopian future, right. you know? Right. How, what was that transition? Who, who, so I kept, who was the visionary that pulled all of you crazies in? Well, I kept doing those puppet shows, you know, on the side. Everybody thought I was crazy to do it. And lo and behold, that puppet show experience got me the job on PB's Playhouse. And that's another lesson I impart to young artists or, or people who want to be an artist. Everybody thought I was nuts to do that, to do those puppet shows. They just kept trying to give me all this common sense advice. Wayne, focus. Be, be a graphic artist or be an illustrator. Go where the money is. Use your sense. Quit playing with dolls all the time, you know? But lo and behold, what everybody thought was the crazy was a crazy waste of time led to the most money I ever made and led to the best career I ever had. That was crazy playing with doll impulse led me to a house in Los Angeles and raising two kids, you know? So don't discount your, lo your secret love that you might be a little bit embarrassed or ashamed to do. I mean, that's part of the, the, the title of the movie comes from that. You know, often what we love is a guilty pleasure or we are afraid to expose our true vulnerable self through the things we love. And it, we're embarrassed often by the things we love or the things we really want to do. And, uh, you know, but truth is beauty and beauty is embarrassing, you know. Don't be embarrassed by it. It's, it's kind of like giving you permission to wear your heart on your sleeve, you know. And this culture does not want you to wear your heart on your sleeve, especially when you're young. The prototype for the young is be wised up and cynical and world weary, you know. What's, up, what's up with that? Like, don't so go you... around so wide eyed, you know. You're going to get the crap knocked out of you, you know. Build that shell and keep, the, and keep building layers on that shell. Wise up. So, so like with the, the kind of hipster mentality is sort of like a very self serious. The hipster kind mentality. Of the opposite of punk in a way. The hipster mentality is mostly full of crap yeah. because they don't respect the wide eyed enthusiasm of the artist. You're supposed to be all world weary and depressed, and that's supposed to be a cool thing to do. Well, I've been depressed. <laughs> There's nothing cool about being depressed. It's a shameful, true depression is a shameful way to be, and, and, and it's anti-life. But back to your question, who pulled it all together? <laughs> sure. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Paul Rubens pulled it all together. Yeah. Paul Rubens was our champion. Uh, he had just come off the movie Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Tim Burton's fe first feature, and he was hot as a pistol. And he had the power that celebrity uh, can give you. And, so, and, he, and also, he was the rare combination of a celebrity who totally understood art and yeah. the creative spirit. And he championed us. He protected us from the network. And also a woman named Judy Price, who was in charge of children's programming, had the same uh, rebel spirit that he did. And they both protected us from the network. Usually networks kill everything yeah. with their notes and their meddling and their, and their worrying about making money and whatnot. But we were in our own protective bubble. And that's the power of the show. It was a new, downtown New York art project done by people all new to Hollywood, a bunch of underground cartoonists, painters, and sculptors. And it just happened to be a New York art project that got on national television. And that's exactly its power. Awesome. Uh, next and slide. of course, the genius of the Pee Wee character. Yeah. I mean, what a great character. He deserves to be right up there with Buster Keaton and yeah. all the greats. Um, so these are, so we have a couple slides of your drawings from the time. Yeah. Um, talk about where did Randy come from? Well, Randy, all the characters were already on paper when I came along. I didn't invent the concepts, but I did invent the visuals. And Randy, of course, is a classic redheaded bully. Uh, you know, I was bullied by a redhead in, in school, <laughs> and I originally wanted Randy to have a southern accent, you know, but no, they wanted to go with this classic, yeah, kind of Bowery Boys kind of thing. <laughs> So I went with that. And you were also the, yeah, the voice. I was the voice. Yeah. yeah, I was the voice. Yeah, smoking's cool, boys and girls. And uh, <laughs> um, 
you know, he's the classic bully that we've all confronted. I mean, one of the classic redhead bullies in cinema is the kid from uh, Christmas Story. Yeah, totally. You know, and uh, but I, did, I that I wasn't thinking of him. I was thinking of my personal experience. But I was delighted to see that particular redheaded bully. That's another cultural icon. That kid. What is it about redheads that makes them such bad people? <laughs> well, are there any gingers yeah. here today? No, I'm I just kidding. I don't know. I, you know, it's just red. You, you know, yeah. see, seeing red. Red is the, is the flag of danger. You know, <laughs> and plus you, they have freckles, and freckles on a puppet are always fun to do. You know, so uh, you'll and, look forward to the comments on the video from that. Yeah, and, and Randy also represents the return to a classic puppet look yeah. that we wanted to bring to Pee Wee's Playhouse. It looks howdy doody. Seems like a howdy a doody. Uh, P, the great Peter Baird, the Jerry Mahoney. Uh, Hard, hard surfaces on puppets. Like the Muppets had ruled the roost for so yeah. long with that plush toy felt and ping pong ball aesthetic yeah. that everybody and their brother copied. I love the Muppets. Jim Henson was a great genius. But man, they had like cornered the market on yeah. puppets. And we wanted to bring back a more classic right. puppet look. And Randy was a classic example of that. The, another character you worked on was uh, Mr. Kite. Yes. Yes, and I was also the voice of Mr. Kite. Rain, PB. Rain. <laughs> and of course, at the time, I was so ambitious and eager. I wanted. I worked harder. I made. That's another uh, uh, quality of mine. I was a horrible student. I didn't look at the. I didn't listen to the teacher. I cased the room. Okay, who's the best one in here? Okay, I'm going to beat you. It was always a competition with me, in a classroom. You know, I wanted to be the best. And I wanted to figure out how to beat everybody else. That's what my sports background has taught me. Maybe a little too competitive. And, and, and in that sense, in that spirit of competition, I did like 50 pages of drawings of Mr. Kite. Yeah, I wonder, I saw the numbers. It's like I 454. Mean, I know, I just really I, I would go overboard with the drawing and the ideas, making sure that I was running circles around everybody in the room. Mm -hmm. it, it, I might not have been the best drawer of the most talent, but I was going to damn sure going to be the hardest worker. And so I drew the hell out of it. And, just every very, and it wound up being the simplest thing possible, <laughs> of course, after all my ideas. And so these are, this is a good example of the design process, but it's also a good example of my overreaching attitude and my overworking attitude, which is a good thing to have. I mean, that's another thing. If, you, if you're not the most talented in the room, make sure you're the hardest working in the room. It'll get you somewhere. Um, next, there's a, um, so this is the clip about, from the movie, like kind of cut up about Pee Wee. Sure. Check it out. That was great. I would, I would like that DVD of the Pee Wee Herman that no one ever saw. Pee -wee well, Sherman. hopefully it's going to be on the extras on the DVD that comes out in February for, cool. the, for the movie. Awesome. Um, so this is one of the word paintings. Yes. So uh, to summarize, I guess, you, you had a, a, a really successful run in Hollywood with, Pee with Pee Wee and Beckman's World and a bunch of other mm -hmm. shows. Mm -hmm. um, and then you kind of burnt out, is that I, to say? Yes. Uh, the typical Hollywood story, I, I, overwork, I got, was overworked. I was oversaturated with being doing kid shows and puppets. I was typed as the wacky kid show guy. And uh, I just needed a break from it all. I, I literally, that's where my depression came in. I was, I was exhausted physically. And uh, like I said, that thing about working harder than anybody in the room, it has its liabilities, you know. And I literally worked myself into a, a rut, into a hole, and I had to get out of that hole. And so I thought I would return to painting. But I wanted to do a 180 from this cartoon expressionism. Uh, that and I wanted to not return to the abstract expressionism I was taught in undergraduate school. So I taught myself traditional painting techniques. I started looking at Winslow Homer and Thomas Aikens and the Hudson River Valley School. I bought a book about how to paint traditional oil paintings. And I started doing these history paintings. Again, hearkening back to my Chattanooga childhood, the Civil War, the Cherokee Indians, uh, the scenic beauty of the place. And I was doing these very traditional kind of history paintings with a kind of a weird under psychological undertones to them. And I was buying thrift store paintings just for the frames. And one day I thought, well, I'm, and, they, and the paintings started getting a little more surreal, the, but they were still traditionally painting, painted. And I thought one day, you know, I'm going to put words into the painting, into a landscape. 
and I picked out uh, one of the uh, thrift store landscapes for the frame. And right before I kicked the, uh, the cheap reproduction out, I thought, what about if I just painted on the landscape that was already in there? You know, <laughs> it would save a lot of time. <laughs> um, and so, on a moment's sp as in a moment's whim, sponta spontaneous. I can't say words today. Spontaneously, yeah. I painted the words into the already pre-existing cheap landscape reproduction, and thus was born a series that I call word paintings. And maybe that's how you first knew of me. That's certainly my most notorious uh, work, a body of work. That's how I got into the fine arts world. I want, I'm I'll, still painting them today. I want to just give you a shout out because there's some really beautiful technical stuff going on with the paintings. The lighting on the letters and the ripples in the water. Like, yeah. It's really Thank well you. done. Thank you. That's, that was from the years of self-study of, of oil painting techniques yeah. and, and doing traditional uh, type of um, uh, rendering in, in paint. Uh, these are in acrylic, but acrylic is just fake oil paint. Sure, so. sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I only use landscape reproductions. I don't paint on originals. Originals have too much of a human smell on them. Plus, that would be an act of defacement because then that original is gone forever. Yeah. The, these reproductions are just empty commodities. There's thousands, maybe even millions of these things. And they're like an empty stage. There's no real art there. There's no human presence. But they are a beautiful setting for these words. And I don't think of them as defacement. I think of them as collaboration with the artist because I respect his, his color palette, his sense of light, yeah. the environmental. I try to get the shadows and everything just right. So it's a bit of a collaboration with these long dead masters of this sofa art genre. <laughs> and, uh, and, and of course, I discovered what began as just a jokey gesture deepened as I started to look at it. You know, it, it references so many things, yeah. Americana, uh, the sense of the past. Uh, it, it's using these, these, these objects that everybody can relate to. They've all seen these paintings at Granny's house or in their own house or at the dentist office. They're a ubiquitous part of American culture, these prevalent kitschy things. So there's that reference point. There's like art history references. And of course, there's the layer of humor I bring to it. So they were very resonant in a way that I never planned in a million years. And I think a lot of the best discoveries and ideas are, happen that way. They just kind of bubble up from your subconscious mm -hmm. and you can't like write a, you can't pre-plan art, you know? It's, it's, a, it's being in the moment. You know, the creative act is not an act of analysis. It's just like listening to some weird gut or some weird voice inside mm -hmm. of yourself. And that, these are a, a, a testament to that. We have a couple more to check out. Yes, this one's called Just a Picture Shunned by Scholars. Now it costs $10,000. <laughs> and uh, that's, you know, my, that's my uh, tribute to the old Burma Shave signs. You, I'm sure a lot of you don't ever heard of that, but people of a certain age, I, I'm a little too young even, but in the early 50s, there was a series of advertisements by the side of the road, rhyming signs, like every 50 yards would be a sign and they rhymed and then the payoff would be Burma shave. You know, <laughs> it was a nice little piece of sequential art by the side yeah. of the road. And I always loved that. We had our own versions of it down in Chattanooga with tourist traps, especially the Georgia game park. See, three-headed dog. See, blah, blah, blah. But it didn't rhyme. This is a direct reference <laughs> to the Burma shave campaigns. And I'm a big, I'm a big fan of roadside attractions and, and Americana and, and early motels and advertising and anything that has to do with roadside America I love. And it's, of course, a sly dig at the pretensions of high and, yeah. high and low art. I don't know if it's sly or not. This, now, this, <laughs> <laughs> this is a series of works I did where I would pour paint on, on, the, on, the, on the picture, let it puddle and dry, and then I would look at it, then I would tell you what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that looked like the profile of Norman Rockwell. <laughs> I can see like a long neck, see? kind of like turtle heads. Yeah, you know, the, you know, we all saw that. We've all seen those pictures of him leaning over with the pipe and his mouth painting. That's the, see the nose and the and the big cranium, you know. And I did I did five or six of those. Didn't sell a one. Nobody liked these. I love them. <laughs> I you like know, I, it. Again, it's commenting on the high on the pretensions of art and how people really look at art. None of us 
let's, come on, admit it. You look at an abstract painting, and after a while, you start going, hey, that looks like a dog. <laughs> that looks, and it's about cloud gazing. You know, we all love to find shapes. We all love to impose our meaning on the world, a world that's really scientifically chaotic and indifferent and uh, couldn't care if we lived or died. Yeah. Yet, we want to impose our human qualities on that world. You know, we're constantly trying to find narrative and meaning and, in accidents and chaos and in nature, and that's you know that's 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 what that's reflective on, cool. both our instinctive view of the world and the pretensions of high art. And it's funny, I think. Yes, the most expensive painting in the world, you know, hyperbole is funny. Yeah. You know. That painting too is about that big. <laughs> <laughs> So be that, like encased behind like six inches. Yes, of like the Mona Lisa. Glass, yeah. Absolutely. So that's again just a just a pot shot at the pretensions of the world, the insane economy of art. You know, the insane way things be, accrue value. Yeah. You know. I mean, back to my uh, my my plasma cutting pizza experience. <laughs> it also became clear to me pretty early on living in, in New York as like a Midwestern teenager um, that the gallery art system is no less ridiculous than like schlubbing to the Village Voice to drop off your editorial illustration portfolio. Yes, and again, it's all about being, the art world is, is fashion, and we all know how absurd fashion is. I mean, if you look to the New York Times fashion supplement magazine, yeah. it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. Who wears those fashions? <laughs> Nobody does. I don't understand fashion. <laughs> These men strutting down the, uh, down the you know, catwalk wearing you know like speedos with a fur jacket <laughs> and they're taking it seriously it's all done with a straight face and it's so offensive to human nature fashion is I have another painting that's called good-looking people having fun without you that's the number one message of the media <laughs> that's the number one message of the media look what you missed look what you are missing out on loser you better buy this watch or these shoes or this jacket to get in on the party that you're missing out on and you never find that party your whole life even the people at the party aren't aren't at that party you know there's this mythic there's this myth Thick, un unattainable, super sexy, super cool ideal that capitalist culture creates and drives us forward by our nose. And it's bullshit. And we live our lives with this insecurity because of that. And, and that's one, I think that's, that's a sacred mission, is to, is to knock down those false idols, the, the emperor's new clothes kind of thing. You know, to break through that and unite us in the fact that we're all just these vulnerable creatures, and that's just crap just to get you to spend your money. I, 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 I'm with you, but I, I saw the show that was at the San Francisco de Young Museum recently for John Paul Gaultier. Yes. That guy's pretty on point. Well, you know what? There's geniuses in the fashion world. Again, I, I take these polemical points, and it sounds... <laughs> I, I do that for the rhetoric and the passion and, and to reach out <laughs> on an emotional level. Yeah. But everything is super complicated. I, yeah, can't, yeah. I can't hit on all the points. I just, I, I have rhetoric, you know. But fashion, <laughs> yeah, I mean, fashion is an, 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 an ingenious, fascinating visual form. And if it's, there's elegance and beauty to it. Even but, humor sometimes. And humor. Yeah, but there's most everything of the time it's there. Ridiculous. But it's really in the hands of money makers. Yeah. You know? That, I'm not belittling any fashion designer or anybody who's interested in it, but it gets in the hands of the money makers and they ruin it. Money makers always ruin everything. Yeah. Well, we all got to make money too. Again, another yeah. like, you know, you can't take any <laughs> position in this world without it having a direct opposite. Yeah. You know? I don't know. I'm finding that out as I go around and become more of a public speaker. I'm often caught up in the heat of my rhetoric, and I'm thinking, good. you know, somebody could debate me down to the ground on this. But I'm trying to hit these emotional points that we all can, can relate to. Yeah. What do we got? What's the next one? So it, got, it looks like... It got crazy. It got crazy. Yeah. I got tired of the straight-ahead text. I mean, just I, I simply wanted to do variations, yeah. you know, and see how far I could push it. These are words made out of a cartoon western town. <laughs> you know, why not? You know, and each it, 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 it literally says all an act, and there's an A laying on its side, 
there's an L, another L, an A, the C, reaching up into the buggy, and then the last, last T. And I was literally trying to push the idea of topography as far as I could go and take the street, a Western cartoon like Tourist Town Street yeah. that you'd see, you know, or uh, in a comic book, and use those as the post and, and lintels of, of topography. Yeah, cool. So I just, I'm just I, I keep trying to push the uh, limits and the possibilities of topography. Yeah. I think topography is a great art form and worthy of, 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 of I'm sure a lot of you, of course, Google is built on the, uh, a lot of the Google image is about typography. Yeah. It's an incredible, it's an incredible topic, inexhaustible. Yeah. Um, and then, this is, a, this is now actually a physical object. It's an aluminum cutout, laser cut aluminum, uh, that's, that floats about two inches from the wall. It says, let's have a smirking contest. That's another, like, uh, condition of society. Yeah. We were talking about earlier with hipsters. hipsters. Yeah. It's cool, like, it seems like the default position of our society is the smirk, you know? If you're smirking, you're cool, man. You, you know, you're ready for all comers. You got your guard up. You know, everything's bullshit, you know. I'm gonna smirk about everything. I'm cool, I'm too cool to believe in anything. You know, nihilism seems to be the default position of our society in so many ways. And the challenge, intellectual challenges seem to be who can be the smirkiest or who can be the most disbelieving, who can uh, cut each other the most, you know. It's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a cruel world, you know. Yeah. And uh, why? <laughs> why? It's all right. <laughs> but it's also funny, too. Let's have a smirk. That, that seems to boil it all down. You know, when two hipsters meet, it's a smirking contest. <laughs> And this is, but on a technical visual level, this reflects my love of sculpture and, yeah. and objecthood and, uh, and literally taking the words out of the context and making them a sculptural object. Yeah. And I love painted metal. This is like painted aluminum, acrylic on aluminum. So I think we have, one, next is one more clip where it kind of brings it home back to Tennessee with one of your good friends. So we'll watch, watch this um, in a project that you did yes. uh, with him. Well, I just want to thank you so much for bringing so many of your ideas to life and letting them come alive and sharing them with us and sharing them with the world. My pleasure. It's, it's great to be here at Google. Been, it's, been a, it's been great to talk to you. And if, um, if anybody has questions, there's a mic in the center, and you can ask Wayne whatever's on your mind. Come on up, please. Make me look good. What do you got? What do you got? No? Can't tell if they're leaving or if they're going to come. Oh, here we go. Hi. Hi. I'm Julie. Hi, Julie. And um, I want to know how did Neil find you or decide to make a documentary about you? Well, I met Neil 12 years ago when he was a young punk right out of Oklahoma. He was interning, an unpaid intern at this design company where I was working. And, um, he, you know, I, I paid no attention to him at all. I just thought, you know, please get away. Give me a sandwich, you know. And uh, 12 years later, he owns that company. That's his company now. That's the kind of guy Neil is. <laughs> and, uh, but three years ago, when my book came out that was edited and, uh, and produced by Todd Oldham, I, he got together with me and said, hey, you're hot property now, man. You got this book. You're in Esquire magazine. Let's do a short film. And uh, that short film grew into uh, a feature film. And here we are three years later. You know? So that's how I met Neil. You know? It was a, and, and I, if, Three years ago, I really didn't know him still. I thought of him as that young kid from Oklahoma. And our friendship grew as this movie grew. And the movie grew organically out of our friendship. I think that's one of the powers of the movie, that it, there was no set agenda. There was no MO. There was no outline, no script, nothing. We just kind of played it by ear. And it reflects our growing familiarity with each other and his discovery of me. And uh, plus, like a lot of people in their 30s, I was, my work had a big influence on him through Pee Wee's Playhouse, the Beekman's World, the Smashing Pumpkin video, et cetera, et cetera. So he was naturally curious because I had this famous stuff I did, but our friendship was reflected in that and my personal life came out through him. So. 
That's awesome. Um, Elaine, his sister, is one of my best friends. Oh, yeah. So she wanted me to tell you that she says you have beautiful eyes. Oh. What you do. <laughs> so Too she... beautiful to be captured on film. Well, yes. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. They're un... Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know why Elaine couldn't tell me that in person. Yeah. <laughs> what? Well, we were on the phone on Friday, and she was going to... I was trying to talk her into like flying here and she was about ready to buy her ticket and come. Oh, uh, well that's very nice. Thanks for relating that information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Come on. Um, so I'm, my name's Chris. Hi I'm Chris. Just hi. Um, I'm just curious where you, where you think you might be headed next in terms of uh, creative endeavors. I know you're still working on the paintings, I'm guessing. The paint, yes. Mm -hmm. The paintings are an ongoing project of mine that I, don't, I see no end to. But the thing that I really am interested in is that uh, is big museum installations, bigger, bigger scaled things. Mm -hmm. I don't, did we see the, yeah, there was a large George Jones puppet yeah, head laying on its side. That's, that's the kind of commissions and the kind of projects I, I'm continuing to, to work on. I just did a big thing down in Virginia at the Taubman Museum. I'm negotiating with my hometown of Chattanooga to do a large public work of the words and an actual Tennessee landscape. Nice. So I want to scale, and as you saw the big puppet, I'm going to be doing some of those in Orange County next year. Uh, yeah, I want to scale it up and work on a, on a larger scale and, and work in a, and on, on the museum level kind of things. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, I have a question about the Smashing Pumpkins video. Yes. Come on, um, how did you decide on the creative direction for that? Well, the concept, again, just like Pee Wee, was already on paper when I came along. They uh, had that new album, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, and the graphics on the album were very Victorian and antique. So they wanted something appropriately antique and 19th century for the look. And they hit upon the idea of the uh, George Millet's film, A Trip to the Moon. So that was already on paper. And the, the directors, Jonathan Dayton and Valerie Ferris, uh, were friends of mine who always, we'd always wanted to work together. And they were familiar with the history paintings I had been doing. I hadn't really started the word paintings yet. So they knew I had a love of 19th century techniques and, and uh, that whole you know, antiquated kind of look. And I love the history. I'm a big student of history. So I just, and I loved the Millets. I already had a big picture book of his that I poured over constantly. So it was a happy coincidence that I could get together and do that. And so, I, again, and then I went crazy on the concept and did a million versions of every scene, you know. So that's how that was born. Were you helping to actually build the props in the sets? I did build a few of the actual props, the, the moon ship that I'm holding in the scene where I break it and it falls apart. <laughs> I built that and a couple of the smaller puppets. But mainly, I did these elaborate production paintings, and I gave them to set builders, and they built the sets from those. Thank you. You're welcome. We're losing. <laughs> All right. All right, anyone else? No? Going once, going twice. All right. Wayne, it was awesome to Thank have you, you here. It was great to be here. Come back Thanks anytime. for having me. Thank you very much. Check out the movie. Thank you. I just want to. A couple of quick things. Sure, sure. There's a brand new app out right now called Words with Wayne. You can take your photograph, type in what, your phrase, and it'll come up as giant monumental block letters in the landscape. <laughs> it's a lot of fun to use, a lot of fun to uh, play around with. Uh, go to beautyisembarrassing.com for a complete list of all the theaters that Beauty is Embarrassing is going to play at all through the fall and the ones that I'm going to be making an appearance at, especially in Berkeley, San Francisco. San Jose and Sa uh, Santa Cruz, that, that's coming up this weekend. Uh, I'll go to WayneWhite.com. There's all, all kinds of great merchandise and stuff there. And there's only 200 of my books left in the world. Wow. So that's one of the last places you can get them. You can buy one there. I'll sign it to you. I'll do a drawing in the book. And uh, There you go, being the hardest working guy again. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm gonna laughs> yeah, and please check out the movie. I know you're all creative people. And it's, it speaks to you. It's a story about the, the ups and, and a, a little bit of the downs, but mostly the ups about the creative life. And I think you'll really identify with it. I think it'll give you a shot in the arm to, to watch the movie. It's my gift to creative people. So enjoy. Thank you very much for having me.